All right, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Justin Virginapa. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Neurosurgery at a Northwell Health. Uh, I have no uh, significant financial disclosures. Um, just a little bit about me. Um, I had the privilege of doing my residency at Northwell Health and working with a bunch of the uh, neurosurgeons at the Chiari Institute during my time there, uh, Dr. Harold Riquet, Dr. Paolo Bellonese, Dr. Salvatore Nsinga, um, before going on to do a complex spine and minimally invasive spine fellowship at Yale University under tutelage of uh, Joseph Cheng, who is currently chairman of the University of Cincinnati, um, before going back to Northwell Health and uh, returning and helping out at the Chiari Institute. So as a fellowship trained spine surgeon, I actually want to talk, start my talk about spinal uh, uh, craniovertebral instability, not talking about craniovertebral instability at all, but really talking about spinal instability in general. So some cases of spinal instability can be pretty uh, dramatic. You can see here this is an 83-year-old female uh, who had a motor vehicle accident complaining of neck pain. Uh, she was found to have fractures of her C2 vertebral body, C3 vertebral body, uh, bilateral pedicle fracture, subluxation of C2 on C3, among other injuries. Other cases of uh, spinal instability may not be uh, that obvious. Um, this is a 20-year-old gentleman who uh, presented with back pain, uh, leg pain, numbness, tingling, uh, going down his legs, resulting in difficulty walking. Uh, patient had to stop going to the gym, playing baseball, had to stop working as a cook. Um, pain basically occurred any time he moved, uh, whether he sat, stand, bended, uh, and his pain uh, was only relieved by laying down. And the patient. Uh, tried physical therapy, chiropractic uh, therapy, but nothing really helped his symptoms. You take a look at this uh, T2 saturated MRI of his lumbar spine, you can see that most of his disc bases are relatively healthy except for uh, this one, which is a little bit darkened, and uh, there's a little misalignment of his L5 and S1 bones, um, which is a grade one spondylolisthesis. If we get a CAT scan uh, to try to figure out why a 20-year-old male has a spondylolisthesis, you can see that the patient has uh, what we call a PARS defect at that level. So these are the types of patients we send for dynamic imaging. We send them up for flexion extension uh, x-rays of their lumbar spine in order to try to assess whether there is any evidence of dynamic instability and abnormal motion of one bone on another. This is the same type of uh, dynamic instability we look for in patients who present to us with uh, trauma. Patients come to us complaining of neck pain. They're in a cervical collar after a fall or a motor vehicle accident. They got a CAT scan uh, of their uh, cervical spine, revealing no fracture. We want to rule out ligamentous injury, so we can either get an MRI or we can get a flexion extension x-ray of uh, the neck in order to try to evaluate for that dynamic instability. Now, not all uh, cases of dynamic instability um, are something that we think to uh, get imaging uh, for. This is an example of a 28-year-old female. She underwent a previous um, lumbar anterior and posterior uh, decompression and fusion uh, with still intractable pain. Um, she underwent a spinal cord stimulator, uh, multiple trials of conservative management, but nothing really seemed to help her symptoms. She got an MRI of her lumbar spine, and um, you don't really see any sort of stenosis, centrally at least, to uh, uh, explain why she has uh, such bad back pain and uh, lower extremity symptoms, but you do see that the disc above the level of her previous decompression and fusion is a little bit darkened. When you uh, take a look at uh, the axial cut through uh, this, uh, that level, you can see that there's actually a significant amount of facet joint fluid um, at that level. If you analyze that further using a CAT scan, you can see that her uh, facet joints are actually not touching one another. And the question is whether this is a competent joint or not. Now these, uh, the CAT scans, the MRIs, are all obtained with the patient uh, laying down uh, in the supine position. So when we send the patient uh, out for uh, standing x-rays, you can actually see that the back of the bone is here, but the back of the bone here is up there. So her facet joints are not that competent, and she has dynamic instability uh, in different positions. And this is more common than you think. This is just another example, 73-year-old uh, gentleman, uh, previous uh, lumbar decompression and fusion. Um, upon analyzing the CAT scan, you do see that there's a little vacuum disc phenomenon at the level of the, above the decompression and fusion. Uh, but this patient is basically suffering from a lot of back pain, lower extremity uh, pain and paresthesias, difficulty walking, frequent falls, reliance on a cane, uh, intractable to conservative management. Um, this is a CAT scan done with the patient lying down. Uh, patient's claustrophobic, so upon going to his MRI, he went to an outpatient uh, standing open MRI, and upon standing, 
you can see that the patient develops a grade one, two spondylolisthesis, uh, which more uh, explains his symptoms than his CAT scan did. So some uh, cases of a dynamic instability, um, you don't want to obtain uh, uh, flexion extension or dynamic imaging on. It's an example of 81-year-old female history of rheumatoid arthritis, has neck pain associated with uh, arm numbness, tingling weakness, difficulty walking, resulting in frequent falls. She's unable to use her hands, dropping objects, difficulty putting on earrings, difficulty buttoning her shirt, difficulty opening jars, now reliant on a cane or rolling walker or walk. Um, if you analyze, take a look at this, you can see that uh, her spinal cord is being compressed at her cervical medullary junction um, between the, this retroodontoid panis and the posterior arc of C1. And the question is why the posterior arc of C1 here, so anterior compared to the rest of her bones, you take a look at their anterior arc of C1, you can see that it is quite far forward in front of the odontoid, which is abnormal. This is a uh, space is called your atlantodental interval. In uh, adults, um, in uh, a CAT scan, you should be less than two millimeters. Hers is about six to seven millimeters, indicating some atlantoaxial instability. So as a spine surgeon, I see a lot of uh, spine patients, uh, including patients with disease of the cervical spine. These are just a bunch of patients with cervical stenosis. And you start to realize what is normal and what is abnormal right away. Um, in these patients, our eyes go directly to here, where there's a spinal cord compression due to spinal cord stenosis and spinal cord signal change. But what we also uh, start to, uh, to take into consideration when we see a lot of these patients is what is normal, and that is this clival axial angle here. Um, and it's almost a straight line, just relatively short of it. In uh, normal patients, the range tends to be between 150 to 165 degrees, uh, depending on what you read. But uh, compare that to this uh, population of patients where it's getting closer to a right angle. And uh, once it gets to this, uh, there's a concern that once you get uh, to a much lower angle, there may be pressure of the odontoid against the ventral brain stem and spinal cord may be obstruction of cerebral spinal fluid, anterior the ventral vein and spinal cord. And this pathological angle is usually considered to be less than 135 degrees. And there's a bunch of other measurements you can use uh, to assess this, but uh, we'll focus mainly on the clival axial angle today. And um, so why does this abnormal uh, angle occur? Usually it uh, occurs uh, in conjunction with uh, one of the hypermobility syndromes. The most common that we uh, deal with is uh, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Um, we also, I showed you an example of a patient with rheumatoid arthritis as well. And what does this uh, lead to? Uh, this can lead to something called cervical medullary syndrome uh, due to uh, impression of the uh, odontoid against the ventral brain stem and spinal cord due to uh, recurrent uh, anterior uh, CSF flow obstruction, uh, deformation of the lower cranial nerves, the vertebral arteries. Uh, and this can result in a whole host of symptoms uh, dealing with vision, hearing, uh, speech difficulties, difficulty swallowing, balance and uh, lots of dysautonomias, as well as uh, the regular signs of cervical myelopathy, upper and lower extremity weakness, uh, sensory loss, um, unsteady gait, bowel and bladder issues. So in patients with uh, severe uh, cases of uh, impression of the odontoid um, against the cervical medullary junction, uh, these patients can undergo uh, cranial cervical fusion in preparation for an uh, odontoidectomy, which may be done either through a transoral or transnasal uh, approach in order to relieve the um, compression uh, on the ventral brain and stem and spinal cord. However, this surgery uh, is a pretty big surgery. It can be pretty morbid. Uh, it has its complications. So at the Chiari Institute, what we spend a lot of time doing is uh, analyzing their flexion extension uh, MRIs in order to see um, if there is impression of the odontoid against the ventral brain stem and spinal cord uh, in a patient with abnormal uh, clival axial angle inflection that is relieved when they actually go into extension. Can we improve that room? Can we uh, decrease that impression? And can they get a one-stage only operation? So patients um, who uh, have a Biden score of uh, at least five or greater indicating hypermobility syndrome. Patients um, who have signs and symptoms of uh, cervical medullary sy syndrome uh, and cranial vertebral instability. Um, patients who have uh, failed the trial of conservative management. Patients who improve while wearing a cervical collar, um, which promotes the neutral or extended position. Who have a KPS score of uh, 70 or less, indicating that they're uh, debilitated and um, have proven uh, flexion extension MRIs showing um, this impression of the ventral brainstem and spinal cord and obstruction of anterior CSF flow. 
um, these patients may be able to, uh, candidates for uh, cranial cervical fusion uh, to correct that. Now this is an example of a patient, a uh, 68 year old female. Um, she presented with dysphagia, upper and lower extremity paresthesias, hand weakness, difficulty walking. She's found to have a Chiari 1 malformation with descent of her cerebral tonsils to about C1, as well as um, an abnormal clival axial angle with some impression of the ventral brain stem and spinal cord at this uh, junction. Um, she also has some uh, T2 uh, hyperintensity uh, from the cervical medullary junction uh, down to about C3 or C4. And actually, if you measure her ADI, it's actually a little abnormal as well. Um, it's uh, a little over three millimeters. Um, less than two is normal. The question is, would it be worse if uh, her uh, cerebellar tonsils did not stop the posterior arc of C1 from going even more anterior? Um, if you take a look at her uh, bones more laterally, you can see that her uh, occipital condyles and C1 lateral masses are actually fused. Uh, and this patient actually underwent just a uh, um, it's QRI decompression plus a C1-C2 uh, fusion, and you can see that uh, two weeks post-op, the patient's uh, T2 hyperintensity has resolved, and the patient is actually doing quite well. So was it the QRI decompression or was it the uh, fusion that made this patient better? This is another example of a patient, 21-year-old female. Um, she has a history of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, previously operated on. Uh, for knee surgeries, uh, foot surgery. She was involved in a motor vehicle accident. Um, she, uh, while trying to save her sister during this accident, she actually developed a extru uh, excruciating neck pain, uh, headaches when she flexes her neck, syncopal episodes, um, arm and leg numbness and tingling, um, as well as a bunch of uh, orthostatic hypotension, uh, tachycardia, frequent diarrhea, urinary hesitancy, um, causing her to uh, stop running. She was a former uh, track and cross country star. Uh, gain weight, have to take her classes from home. She's tried medical management, chiropractic therapy, nothing has really helped her. Um, she actually has to keep her uh, laptop at eye level in order to prevent her from flexing her neck and worsening her symptoms. Um, this patient, upon analyzing her flexion extension MRI, she was found to have a cervical syrinx as well as an abnormal clival axial angle, but no real uh, descent of her uh, cerebral tonsils below the foramen magnum. Uh, she did uh, opt to go for surgery for stabilization of her uh, cranial cervical junction. Um, she actually did quite well. Um, she uh, left the hospital just two days after surgery with improvement in most of her symptoms. And she obtained a baseline MRI just uh, two before she left, uh, post-op day two. You can see that the syrinx is actually starting to improve right away. And uh, this is her uh, post-op MRI six weeks after surgery, ignoring the street guard effect up there from the screws. Uh, you can actually see that the syrinx is completely resolved. This is uh, another example of a patient. This is a 41-year-old female, history of a previous Chiari decompression. Uh, she actually un also underwent um, creation of a terminal ventriculostomy in order to try to improve her known uh, cervical thoracic syrinx, uh, who uh, presents with a lot of pain at the back of her head and neck, difficulty holding up her head, making her feel like a bobblehead, dizziness, um, as well as uh, left arm uh, symptoms and pain rating to her hand. Um, she underwent uh, a cranial cervical uh, fusion for um, an abnormal clival axial angle. And you can actually see three months post-op that the syrinx, while not completely gone, is certainly much better than it was preoperatively. So this is typically what um, an occipital cervical fusion looks like. Um, but while we uh, tout our successes, sometimes we also have to note um, failures in order to figure out how to uh, get better and improve on what we do. This is an example of a patient who had uh, occipital cervical fusion. Uh, using with the use of occipital uh, screws, where you can see that the uh, um, screws are backing out of the skull, as well as there's loosening of uh, all the other screws in her occiput. So how do we prevent this? How do we fix this? Using the principles of spine surgery, um, we can use larger diameter screws, we can use larger thread depths, larger thread pitches or distances between threads, try to obtain bicortical purchase, use longer screws, use larger screw triangulation. We've actually uh, tried going to a model of hardware that looks something like this. This is called an occipital bolt and anchor, which sandwiches the occiput between uh, this construct in order to prevent pullout. However, uh, this construct is not without its uh, issues. Um, you can see how proud it sits, first of all, especially on patients who have a very petite frame. They find it very uh, painful to lay on something like this. Um, there's also uh, been issues with uh, patients not fusing across this distance between uh, C1 and the occiput. Uh, and the question is whether there's uh, any abnormal micromotion that's preventing that fusion and causing pseudoarthrosis. Uh, 
So something new that we've uh, been move, moving to within the last uh, couple of years is the placement of occipital condyle screws. These screws are much lower profile as opposed to sitting out here. They sit down here. It's a much shorter distance to fuse, uh, to try to fuse between the occiput and C1. And they allow you to place longer screws, bigger screws in more medial direction. Um, but we weren't sure if it's just condylar screws where we're going to fix everything. Is it just a matter of occipital screws uh, versus our anchors versus the occipital condyle screws? So what we did was uh, we actually tried to analyze um, our uh, about patients that we did uh, craniocervical fusions for for this indication between 2015 and, 2012 and 2015. And uh, these were all patients who had both pre- and post-operative imaging, and we measured their uh, pre-operative clivoaxial angle and post-operative clivoaxial angle, as well as their grabbed oaks line, and looked for signs of adjacent, adjacent segment pathology, such as cervical kyphosis, cervical disc degeneration, and cervical subluxation. Um, doing about 20 craniocervical fusions a year, we had uh, 80 some patients to look at. About 70 patients had both their pre- and post-operative imaging, and we found that about 14% developed adjacent, uh, developed uh, cervical kyphosis, about 4% developed cervical subluxation, about 3% had to undergo revision surgery. So why is this? Upon uh, analyzing their uh, pre-operative and uh, CXA, there was no uh, real difference between patients uh, preoperative CXA uh, in patients who basically failed or did not fail. Uh, whether they, the fusion was extended to C2 or C3 also didn't seem to matter. However, what did seem to matter was uh, how much their uh, CXA was corrected to. Um, patients who had a CXA that was much higher were found to have a much more high, higher likelihood of failing. Um, patients with a CXA postoperative of 145 were found to have about a 5% risk of adjacent segment pathology, whereas patients with a CXA of uh, 155 were found to have a much higher, almost 29% uh, risk of adjacent segment pathology. And this kind of makes sense, right? Um, I like to show my residents uh, this picture. This is a picture of a patient who previously underwent a thoracolumbosacral uh, anterior and posterior uh, fusion. Um, and if you take a look at it, uh, just this one image, you say that, oh, it looks probably okay. But if you zoom out and take a look at the global picture, you realize this is really not okay. Um, taking the patient's whole global alignment into account, you can see the patient's developing adjacent segment disease, uh, proximal junctional kyphosis, proximal junctional failure, compressions above the area of their fusion. Their head no longer sits above their pelvis, resulting in uh, positive sagittal balance. And overall global alignment is something that uh, is becoming a big topic in spine surgery as far as uh, health-related quality of life. And this will lead to stress on the hardware um, and pull out and fracture of the screws. So the same goes with the cranial cervical junction. Um, this is an example of a patient who has been corrected to a CXA of 156 degrees. And it looks okay uh, if you just look at it uh, in this zoom point of view. But once you uh, zoom out, you can see that it's not that normal. Um, patients are developing cervical kyphosis below hand. And why is this the case? If you think about it, it makes sense, right? Because if you fuse a patient in an extended position, where do the eyes look? They look up in the air. If you try to bring your, that patient's eyes back to straight, as we like to do as uh, human beings, then how do you do that? You have to flex over your lower uh, cervical spine in order to do that. Try holding that position for you know, even seconds to minutes, and it's extremely uncomfortable to do. And imagine these patients with uh, living with this, uh, then they have chronic pain. This is an example of a patient who uh, had a CXA corrected to uh, quite a high degree. Um, she ended up developing uh, extreme tenderness around her occipital anchors, um, some loosening of her C2 pedicle screws. You can actually see this crosslink has popped off the rod on that side. Um, and uh, we ended up correcting that by placing occipital condyle screw here, taking on our occipital anchors, and distracting between the occipital condyle screw and the C1 screw in order to decrease her uh, clival axle angle to something that she more could tolerate, which corrected her cervical kyphosis. So we still have more work to do as far as this topic is concerned. Um, doing about 20 patients a year, um, we have about another 60 patients or so to analyze between 2016 to 2018. Is it an issue of uh, the hardware we use between the occipital anchors, uh, the occipital screws, the occipital condyle screws? And is it a matter of uh, how, to what clival axial angle we fuse these patients to, uh, and, or do we need to even correct their clival axial angle? Is it the abnormal motion itself that uh, is abnormal and is causing the, these patients' issues, 
And if so, can we just fuse the patients in situ, much like fusing a high-grade uh, spondylolisthesis, spondyloptosis in situ instead of uh, trying to realign the patients? So uh, much more work on that to be done in the future.